Hello, this is Dean from Meet the Globe with Pat Farmer. He's, he's here to, today to share with us uh, his experience running from the North Pole to the South Pole, which is basically the equivalent of running two marathons every single day for almost a year. So over 20,000 kilometers he ran. And uh, most importantly, he raised a million dollars, a hundred million dollars. Oh, no, no, no. Um, uh, we, ra we, we actually raised one million dollars and then more money had been coming in from there. So I don't know the exact figure, but okay. we, we'd raised a substantial amount we of money. Either way, he, he raised a lot of money in the millions uh, for the International Red Cross, which is, which is amazing. So, uh, Pat, running through all these uh, different countries, 40, 14 of them, I understand, must have been a, a pretty uh, rich cultural experience. Uh, what were the most memorable countries uh, you visited in, in this trip? Uh, well, every country had its own flavour, had its own, you know, something unique and different about it. Like when I, uh, of course, being dropped off in the, the North Pole was just the most... Um, it was like just being dropped off in the freezer of your <laughs> fridge and, and being left there for 39 days. So it was completely different to anything I'd experienced and trying to make my way out of there. But then, of course, Canada had the mounted police and, uh, you know, just a different different scenario altogether. And it was quite a relief to see people and to mix with people and to be able to eat solid food and mm. be on dry land and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So it, it was very memorable to me. But I think mainly because it was just complete contrast to what I'd been to. And then, of course, going through America, everything's about 7-Elevens and instant food and, <laughs> and junk and rubbish and whatever's available that's high in sugar content anywhere along the way so uh, um, I had my fair share of that but, <laughs> but uh, you know I was still running and trying to get my hands on decent food uh, as I went through the whole thing so they were all very interesting but I loved Central America I think Mexico has the absolute mm. best uh, ice cream in the world mm. without a doubt it um, must be the cows must be the cows <laughs> that they have there so, um, you think of Mexico and you think about it being like a desert, okay. but it's actually a place that's got incredible um, greenery and really a really good thriving uh, cattle population and um, a very healthy population of cattle there. Mm. So I think that's why they have a good dairy product. Fantastic, fantastic. So um, out of all the uh, places you've been to, what were probably the top two or three different types of food that you tried that were quite out of the ordinary, something that you've never tried before? Oh, so, any sort yeah. of particular dishes that oh, you tried? Oh, well, there was lots of, yeah, lots of things. Well, you know, I had a guinea pig in Ecuador, Ooh. so... Um, I like wasn't... chicken? <laughs> I love that saying. I had, a, I had one guy come out of the, come out from off the side of the road, and he said to me, you want to try iguana? You want iguana? And I, I was running and uh, I was running past it and I said to my crew, my, one of my crew members was with me, I said, what did he say? And they went back to talk to him and uh, he had a, these, these two iguanas which were just like great big uh, goannas and he, he would want to sell us those to eat. Yeah. And so I, and I, said, I said no, but um, I said to Katie, my crew member, go back and ask him what they taste like, you know, what, what's iguana taste like? And he went back and he said, I taste like chicken, and I said to Katie, just give me a chicken. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was interesting. The guinea pig was uh, was interesting. It it tastes um, uh, it's a little bit of a gamey meat, but um, gamey, okay. yeah, uh, you know, so, sort of like hare. If you have um, like like rabbit. rabbit, yeah, strong rabbit uh, mm. flavour. Uh, so I had that. Um, I had the best lamb I've ever tried in my life. Australians and Kiwis, uh, New Zealanders think they've got the best lamb in the yeah. world. But down in Argentina, mm. and um, they have the best lamb, oh. and they do it in a barbecue style. Okay. And the reason why it's so good, I surmise, mm. is because it's so cold down there, down mm. the southern point. You've got to imagine, like it's the closest part of the world to the South Pole, mm. and the winds just howl around there, and it's mm. very icy and cold down around Ushuaia most of the time. Mm. So for that reason, the lamb builds up a lot of mm -hmm. uh, fat. Mm -hmm. And so when they barbecue the lamb, they do have a special style of cooking it like a barbecue style. And when they cook it on the coals and they barbecue it like that, the fat goes through the meat as it's cooking it and tenderizes it. Wow. And i got to say, yeah, it tasted fantastic. But, you know, on a run like that, where you do almost 21,000 kilometers, anything would taste fantastic. <laughs> but it really did taste good. <laughs> awesome. That sounds great. So... I guess in your opinion, running through, uh, after running through so many countries, going from the cold to pole, 
um, do you believe that you experienced a country that had a really strong food culture? Like out of all those countries, which one would you say had the strongest food culture? Uh, it's look, it's hard to say. I think yeah, you know, it's really hard to say because they're all they're, yeah, they all have different types of food. Mm. Um, undoubtedly, when I was going through El Salvador, I was on the coastline a lot of the way, so you know, okay. there's lots of seafood and yep. good quality seafood as well. Seafood, uh, um, okay. <clears throat> the beer is very cheap there too, by the way. Uh, my crew told me that. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, the foods. Um, I think really uh, Ecuador, Colombia stood out as far as coffee culture was concerned. Mm -hmm. The best coffee I've ever Even tasted then? on the face of the planet. I was running along, and I had uh, the. I was running what they call the coffee, the the, the coffee road, uh, mm -hmm. and there's just for. Um, around about 80 kilometres on both sides of the road, no more than that, probably 160 kilometres on both sides of the road, are just coffee plantations. Mm, and there's wow. all these little cafes uh, dotted in amongst them on the farms themselves. Okay. And I was running along there, I had police escort, mm. and this guy came out dressed like a waiter with a silver platter and a, and a single cup of, uh, of coffee on it, just mm -hmm. a short black. Yep. And he offered it to me uh, uh, while I was running, and, and I said, <laughs> run along with me. He came along with me. Just, in steps and I grabbed the coffee and took it back and it, it blew my mind maybe mm. because I was really you know like mm. craving something at the time but mm. wow it was fantastic it tasted incredible uh, so much so that then the police ended up going back to there and, uh, and my crew went back to there and they all agreed it was the best coffee they'd ever had so yeah the coffee culture of Colombia uh, the lamb of the uh, you know, southern part of Argentina and uh, through Chile and, and, and down that region. Um, uh, but um, Ecuador, Ecuador, like I say, you know, they have um, you know, unusual stuff like iguana and uh, although it's hard to get your hands on, I suppose, and I don't even know if it's legal. Uh, um, uh, but they, they have that, they have um, uh, you know, the, the guinea pig, uh, lots of, lots of Pig, but um, uh, so lots of pork. Yep. Um, I found the best pork that I'd ever tasted in my life actually in Canada, and I've heard that worldwide. A lot of people talk about Canadian pork as Canadian being pork. really good quality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so I, I got to try some of that. And a lot of people think when you're running, you can't take in meat, but yep. believe me, when you're running that far every single day, you can take in anything you can get your hands on, <laughs> anything you can chase you've down. You've burned a lot of, yeah. Yeah, you've burned yeah. a lot of carbs. So many calories. calories and then, yeah. of course, when I was in the North Pole, as we spoke earlier on, um, you know, I was surviving on dehydrated uh, uh, um, packet food that you would melt snow and add it to. Uh, that together with um, olive oil, I drank copious amounts of olive oil because the olive oil doesn't freeze up easily. And so I had that in my sled that I dragged along and, and I was able to um, able to take that in and that had a high fat content. And I chewed on, I, 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 I ate big chunks of butter all the time. So, you know, that helped me to replace some of the fat content. But I still dropped down to only 49 kilograms by the time I got off wow. the ice and hit Canada. So I was skin and bones by the time I got wow. to there. Well, that, that, that sounds intense, that's all I can say, but yeah, it was you know, full on. Yeah. It was pretty full on. <laughs> my hat's off to you for, 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 for uh, trying such a crazy feat, but you did it. I that's... was 75 kilos when I started and down to 49 kilos, and I think that was the only saving grace. I came across a black bear in Canada and he just looked at me and put his head back down and kept walking across the road. It was like, there's no meat on that guy. <laughs> not worth eating. <laughs> it's not worth Not worth me chewing. <laughs> yeah. Too gristly. <laughs> Um, so, so Pat, after doing such a, a long run, uh, so so I think it was ten months, is that right? Yeah, ten months and thirteen days. Yeah. Wow. So almost a year. So after basically running for almost a year, uh, and, and going through so many countries, uh, from a I guess a spiritual point of view, um, has this um, has this run changed your view of the world, of people, yeah. of societies? Has it changed your, you in any way after after running such yeah, a fair distance? Yeah, absolutely. You know, most of the most of the contentious issues in the world these days is about ownership you know everybody wants to own something we all want to own material goods or we all want to own out this block of land or we all feel this is our country and you shall you shall not come into our country or you shouldn't come here you shouldn't come there and so there's all this protection of borders there's all this fear of something being taken away from us 
Um, when I ran on that journey, not only did I see the world through completely different eyes, but I travelled from one country to the next country to the next country, and the one thing that stood out the most to me was that people all over the world are the same. You know, it doesn't so matter what religion they are, it doesn't matter what food they eat, it doesn't matter what climate they come from, what colour their skin is, uh, what their beliefs are. At the end of the day, they all want their children to grow up and have an opportunity at this life, a better opportunity than they've had. Uh, and they want to try and provide that for their kids and, and they want to try and live a happy life and, uh, and, and a quality of life. And, you know, so if we stop thinking about what we possess and we stop thinking about borders and zones and all the rest of it, we start thinking about all of humanity and that the fact that we're, we're only transient through this whole planet anyway and we're only here for a space and time. So instead of trying to build on something that we can't take with us anyway, we need to just enjoy the moment. That's what I get absolutely, out of running and absolutely. that's what I get out of travel and that's what I get about life itself, you know. It's all about just enjoying the moment because we don't know where the next moment will be or if there'll even be a next moment. So if while ever we think like that, then we'll be kind to each other, we'll enjoy the moment and we'll and we'll we'll see all that this life has to offer. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for that, Pat. That, that those are very wise words and you know, someone who's uh, run from pole to the pole and uh, having that revelation is is, 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 a, is a great experience you can share with our readers. So I, I think uh, that's that's a great uh, way to uh, see the world. I, yeah. think, I think that's the, that's the way that we should see the world. Well, well, you know, if you can do it on a motor vehicle or a jet ski <laughs> or a, a, a nice motor cruiser, then. Uh, that's not a bad way to see the world either, <laughs> but uh, you know, you just do what you can do, but you get out there and see the world. I think the most bigoted attitudes come from people that only, uh, you know, stay where they are. They Absolutely. they have little education on other people, and you know, I, you know, a, a typically bigoted attitude is when Australians turn around and say, "Why don't they speak English here?" Well, you know, when you go to parts of China as I've done, or Japan, or you know, throughout Nepal, or other parts of the world, or you know, anywhere throughout Europe and 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 you're the one that, that has to speak Spanish or French or Cantonese or you know or, uh, any language any yep. other language then you start to realize this is not so easy why can't they just try and work with me and all I want is a drink or all I want is something to yeah. eat so you see it from other people's points of view and I think that in itself is an education and I think that we the more educated we are the, the more we break down the boundaries and the barriers, mm. and the more we break down the boundaries and the barriers, the more that we see everybody is just like ourselves and, exactly. and there's harmony in the world. Absolutely. That's, that's what, what it's all about at the end of the day, right? We're trying to get to world peace, which it, it will happen one day. <laughs> well, we, you know, I know it's a, a, people would see this as being almost fanciful, but, you know, imagine a world that didn't have any borders whatsoever, that yeah. if you wanted to go to another country, you just go to another country. Whatever country you're in, that's the country you pay tax to. Yeah. So you pay tax to that country for the infrastructure, so mm. you might do that through a whole raft of different tax regimes that that country has. Mm. And then you go to another country and you're paying the tax in that country. So. Mm. Uh, you're supporting wherever you're living at that time mm. but you can go to anywhere and you can travel from place to place and if you choose to buy a house in that area or have a, have a place in that place and live there well so, so be it but mm. that shouldn't restrict you from going somewhere else if you want to go there as well. So, exactly. exactly. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an idealist uh, mm. point of view but, mm. but you know it would stop a hell of a lot of the fighting in the world and mm. I think governments purposely ramp up a lot of negativity because that's how they protect what, what they are what they are and what they do. Yeah. It's not humanity, it's just a, a single-minded government, that's all. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, Pat, thank you so much for sharing your experience uh, on your pole-to-pole -pole run. It's been, you. it's been a, a great chat, and all the best of your future runs. Look yeah, forward to hearing about much. it. Yeah, UAE, Cuba, um, Philippines, who knows where next? There <laughs> was India last year, but uh, yeah, who knows where next, but there will definitely be another country to conquer this year. Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks for checking in, guys.